Hey guys, thanks for watching. Um, so you're here because you requested a copy of a recording of a speech that I did for the NSEA about resistance training in hypermobile athletes. Um, so here we go. If you do have any questions, most of you will receive this by email. So feel free to email me back uh, about anything you see in the presentation that you want to discuss further. So before we start, I think it's important to define all the terms in our title that we have here. So resistance training for the hypermobile athlete. Resistance training is any form of strength training where we're trying to create or resist force. Hypermobility means having more mobility than expected. And athlete, I like the saying, if you have a body, you are an athlete. Just gonna pause this for one second here. So who am I? Uh, most of you, if you requested this, you might know something about me or you might know nothing about me. My name is Sarah Wynn Beruza. I graduated from SUNY Cortland uh, with a Bachelor's of Science in Exercise Science, Concentration in Kinesiology, did some work in Biology and Chemistry as well. That was in 2012. Graduated from Sacred Heart University with my Doctorate in Physical Therapy in 2015. And after I got out and started working in the physical therapy prof profession, um, I realized that although I had an interest in strength and conditioning, I really needed some more formal knowledge to help my patients. A lot of the patients I was working with at the time, they were just, we, the heaviest weight I think we had in the clinic was like eight pounds. And so, you know, some patients didn't even get up to that. And it was like, oh, only the, the uh, stronger gentlemen even used eight pound weights. But when you think of it, even the older women or, or whoever that was coming in the clinic probably were picking up a purse, picking up their laundry baskets, maybe a pot on the stove that could be approaching that eight pounds. And so everybody really needs some form of strength and conditioning, depending on uh, what level they're at, but some form of it will be helpful. So now I live in Fairfield, New Jersey with my husband and my puppy, April. This is a picture of April right here. Um, last spring in the spring of 2020, uh, while everybody was quarantining, I did a lot of physical therapy and performance training sessions out of my home. And so I set up this little area and April loved to hang out there with me and make some appearances on the session. So I figured I would include her here in this session as well. So what do I do? In 2016, I uh, moved from New York to Texas for a job working with gymnasts. And while I was there, I had great exposure to all different conditions. And we also worked with athletes and adults with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I'll get into that a little bit more later, but that is a condition that leads to hypermobility in the joints. And I started seeing the spectrum of mobility a little bit more clearly. I had been a gymnast my whole life. So for me, it was normal for people to be able to pick their leg up over their head. And it was, oh, look how cool that is. Um, but then really looking at the impact that has on the joints and how it changes what we do, I began to see that a little bit more clearly. For three years after that, I did some traveling physical therapy and I started to realize how things really flip-flopped on each side of that mobility spectrum. So the changes that needed to be made um, based on the type of client that you were working with. And in October 2019, I opened my own clinic in Fairfield, New Jersey, and I do uh, physical therapy and performance training for athletes. And I specialize there in gymnasts and others with hypermobility. So what is hypermobility? We can look at this athlete right here and say, they're definitely pretty hypermobile. They're definitely over flexible. Let's look at all those joints. That knee is hyperextended. That hip is hyperextended. Um, even the neck there is pretty far extended. And we can say pretty clearly, this person has some hypermobility. Um, and some of us may be familiar with working with athletes that are like this, that are clearly hypermobile. And some of us may be looking at this saying, uh, it's not really me. I generally work with athletes uh, more like baseball players, football players, things like that. I don't really work with that type of athletes. Well, then I'm going to ask you, what about these guys? So we can look at this baseball player over here on the left side. And if we look at that shoulder external rotation that he has, uh, that's quite a bit there. Um, so we might consider that hypermobile. Then we can slow down and look at some of the elbow hyperextension. And most of us who have worked with teenage athletes have probably seen this type of elbow hyperextension and maybe not thought much of it. But when we look at adding the force of throwing a ball, catching a ball, potentially even weight bearing on those hands, we can see where that might begin to become a problem. And lastly, there's a picture of the swimmer here. And uh, 
you might need to move my screen of me talking out of the way to see her. And we might look at that at first and say, well, there's really nothing wrong. That position doesn't look too excessive in any one direction. Um, but I want you to remember that she's recovering here. So if, if you're watching this, if you can, go ahead, put your arms up over your head like that, and then reach behind your head. Some of us may be able to do it. Some of us may not. But is this a position that you would consider comfortable, something that you would recover in from a hard workout? Probably not. And, and if you do, you might have some hypermobility of your shoulders as well. So I want to talk quickly about proprioception. That's going to be a really important topic in this, uh, in this conversation here. So proprioception is defined as perception or awareness of the position and movement of the body. And there's sensory receptors in the skin, the joints, and the muscles. So people with clinically significant hypermobility have been found to have some decrease in these sensory receptors and therefore decreased proprioception. So when we are training them, that's something that we need to take into consideration and try to be increasing that proprioception where possible. So I mentioned earlier that I see mobility as a spectrum. And here's kind of an illustration of it right here. We can go from hypermobility to normal, relatively normal mobility and hypomobile um, on the opposite side. So I like to say normal is just sitting on a washing machine. Normal mobility is really gonna be relative and that's gonna be to age norms, gender norms, sport participation norms. Um, we can go back to talking about that baseball pitcher a lot of pitching athletes generally are going to have increased external shoulder uh, rotation and possibly some decreased internal shoulder rotation. Uh, that's pretty normal for them. So we'd probably consider them somewhere in the middle um, and just compare them to other uh, children or adults of their same age, same gender, and same position to kind of decide if they really have a problem one way or the other. Um, it can also be different in different joints of the body. and so most of us strength and conditioning coaches probably work with athletes in this area of the spectrum. So somewhere from normal to a little stiff, especially if we work with older adults um, or adults of any kind, somebody who sits at a desk all day. But what I wanna talk about is in this blue circle here. So the hypermobile end of the spectrum, uh, gearing a little bit towards the normal. And you might notice that the tail end of both sides are out of the circles, out of the picture. And that's because they're really outside the scope of this presentation and somebody who's really on either tail end there probably needs some medical attention, some clinical attention from a physical therapist or somebody like that to bring them a little bit more towards the middle before we can really talk about strength and resistance training with them. So I wanted to go over a few conditions that are related to hypermobility. Uh, we can talk about Down syndrome, cladocranial dysotosis, Ehlers-Danlos, marfan Morchio. And then uh, all those things might be something that you see on a medical history and you can anticipate there might be some level of hypermobility. Of course, we still want to assess, but just something to keep in mind. And then finally, somebody can have what's called benign hypermobility, which is basically hypermobility that's just there by itself. It's not part of any other condition. And this can be acquired or it can be genetic. So it can be something later in life or there, there have actually been some genes linked to it. So it could be due to that. So how do we identify hypermobility? Um, there's two different standardized tests or standardized questionnaires that we can use. And I would imagine most of us before beginning a strength training program with anybody are gonna do some sort of assessment, some sort of screening. So these might be some useful things to add onto that screening. We'll start with the Baton score or the Biden score. And if you have some room while you're listening to this and you can, I want you to stand up, give this a try, give yourself a score. The first movement is going to be going palms flat to the floor in front of your feet. If you can do this, award yourself one point. Then we're going to look at each elbow, and each elbow that extends more than 10 degrees will give you another point. And if you look at the picture uh, in this illustration for reference, that's going to be about 10 degrees. Um, then we're going to look at your knees, and if they passively hyperextend more than 10 degrees, you'll get a point for each knee. Then we're going to move on to the hands. We're going to approximate the thumb to the forearm. You can see I'm pretty far away right there, but some people can touch. So if you can actually touch there, one point for each of those. Then we're going to take the little finger and extend it back. And if we get 90 degrees or more, we're going to get another point for each hand there. 
So that's going to add up to nine points, four that occur on each side of the body, and then the toe touch or, or flat hands on the floor, which is just one point in total. So in adults, a score greater than four is going to be considered a, is a positive test for hypermobility. In children less than 18, a score greater than six is going to be considered a positive test for general hypermobility. Next, we can move on to the five-point questionnaire. So there's going to be a lot of similarities between this and the Baton test. It is a bit more subjective. So can you now or could you ever place your hands flat on the floor without bending your knees? Can you now or could you ever bend your thumb to touch your forearm? As a child, did you amuse your friends by contorting your body into strange sh shapes or could you do the splits? As a child or teenager, did your shoulder or dis kneecap dislocate on more than one occasion? And do you consider yourself double jointed? So one point for each of those and three or more is considered hypermobile. This is not differentiated between children and adults. Um, like I said, this one is a bit more subjective and I don't think it really captures true hypermobility as well because when we look at uh, gymnasts, dancers, athletes like that, most of them are going to have at least three points off the bat if they're succeeding in that sport at all. And while I do think a lot of those athletes have hypermobility, I don't think it's all of them. Um, but just another option there. The last thing is a range of motion screening. One thing to remember with this is, so this is where we're just looking at the motion of each joint and seeing if it's more than what we would expect for our age, gender, sport participation. However, hypermobility refers to the joints themselves and soft tissue stiffness can mask hypermobility. So take the shoulder, for example, reaching up overhead the joint may actually be hypermobile and be able to go more, but the soft tissues, the muscles, tendons, things like that, may actually stiffen to prevent that shoulder from going to the end range to decrease the likelihood of dislocation. Um, so that is an option, but it's just something to remember that it might not really catch everything. So why is this important for me to know as a strength coach? Um, you might be thinking about that. You might think, okay, so I can assess these athletes, You know, maybe I find some hypermobility, uh, what do I do with that information? How does that change what I'm going to do? There's still a first baseman, there's still a gymnast, there's still a lineman, whatever it is, they still have to participate in their sport. They still need to be strong to do so. And that's absolutely the case. Um, one thing to remember is that a 2017 study found that athletes who were hypermobile, um, they tend to be athletes who drop out of sport, drop out of resistance training, physical activity, because they don't do so well with it. And it can cause them pain at times if it's not properly addressed. And those athletes who receive specific advice on exercise um, for people with hypermobility were 75.3% more likely co to continue exercise in some form for the next five years. And I think that's important. Anybody who's a strength coach, probably anybody who's listening to this presentation is interested in keeping people active, continuing their resistance training. So if we can make some small tweaks, give some specific advice to these populations and make them over 75% more likely to continue, um, that's probably something we want to do. The same way somebody who's stiff, maybe has stiff shoulders um, and wants to be able to overhead press, we might give them some individual mobility advice or uh, progressions to lead up to that overhead press. Um, this is kind of the similar idea, just a little bit different application. So I put up here four statements that I think most of us can agree on in most cases normally when we're working with a strength and conditioning population, strength and conditioning group. Now I understand there's always exceptions to this, but overall I think we can agree that generally athletes are gonna do some mobility work and then stability work. They're gonna come into the weight room, they're gonna show up to practice, and they're gonna mobilize a little bit um, before they hit the weights then we can, most of us can agree that we want to see some proper movement patterns before we load, especially when we're working with children, before we allow them to squat with a barbell on their back, we're going to look at for a perfect or near perfect uh, body weight air squat. Next thing, big shift in the strength and conditioning profession uh, over the last many years has been going to compound movements over single joint movements. So looking at movements that more closely mimic the sport or functional activities um, we can agree these are pretty important and carry over pretty well. And we can also mostly agree that in general, we want to lock out at the end of a movement. We want to complete that squat fully standing up. We want to complete that snatch or overhead press all the way overhead. 
So these are things that are uh, usually the case with most of the populations that we're working with. And I wanna discuss a little bit how that flip-flops for people with hypermobility. So for people with hypermobility, we might do mobility work after stability work, if at all. So when these people walk into the weight room, uh, their warm-up may be more of just a true warm-up, warming up the tissues, increasing blood flow, not necessarily doing any mobility work. If they need it, it might be better to do it after they've done their stability, after they've done their weight training, so that they don't uh, become too any more hypermobile or any looser in their joints than they already are. Another thing is that we may need to load them early. So uh, any of you who have ever done some of the Olympic lifts, this is where I really feel it like a clean or a snatch. Um, it's hard to under, understand the technique until you have some weight on the bar. And I'm not saying a maximum amount of weight, um, but those of us who have tried to do those lifts with a PVC pipe or maybe even an empty barbell or training barbell really can't feel the movement, can't feel the need to pull and pull yourself under the bar. This can be the same for hypermobile athletes in all lifts. So we may need to give them a small amount of loading. Again, nothing near a one rep max, maybe not even a 10 rep max, just a small amount of load that will actually increase their proprioception because it will increase their afferent discharge from their central nervous system to understand the movement more correctly if they have a little bit of load. Next, we may need to do some single joint movements before compound movements. We talked a little bit earlier about how hypermobile athletes tend to have poor proprioception. And so we may need to help them understand the movements and the true end ranges of each joint or the functional end ranges of each joint before we allow them to do some compound movements. So again, we'll, we'll talk about the Olympic lifts because they are kind of the quintessential compound movements. Somebody has hyperextension, 20 degrees of, of elbow hyperextension. We may want to help them understand where that true elbow extension without hyperextension occurs before we have them up overhead in a snatch or overhead lift with 20 degrees of hyperextension. That, that could be dangerous. So we might want to work on the single joints first before we put it together. And then the next thing I'm going to relate it to this again is that we may want to keep some tension through the movement. So with these populations, they're locking out at the top of the lift has kind of actually passed the lockout, passed the full extension and gone over to the other side, we may want to limit that. So we may want to stand up from that squat, but not allow the knees to hyperextend, especially if we have a bunch of weight uh, on the front of the bar or anything like that. So we may want to keep some tension there to help keep the, the information from the tendons and ligaments going and not just lock out those joints. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more that we want to get those joints into a closed chain position. So if you don't understand exactly what that means, that's fine. Just hang on. We'll, we'll get there in just a minute. So next I want to talk about this study. There are very, very few studies on resistance training specifically in this hypermobile population. And those that are out uh, generally deal with somebody with clinically diagnosed hypermobility syndrome. So like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome versus somebody who's just a little bit over flexible, a little bit, their joints are a little bit loose. Um, like we talked about that mobility is a spectrum and different joints can be on different sides. So when selecting participants for a study, uh, it can be very difficult to determine who's hypermobile and how do we classify them and is it all their joints. So generally uh, any studies that are done are gonna be with somebody who can be genetically tested and determine that they have this Ehlers Demos or have some, some other syndrome that would lead to the hypermobility. Um, but this study in 2014, it did show increased muscle strength, decreased tendon elasticity, decreased pain, improved balance, and improved proprioception after resistance training. So these are all the things that we've already talked about. Um, obviously, we want to improve proprioception. We want to improve muscle strength. Decreasing tendon elasticity can improve the joint stiffness, which is what we want. And decreasing pain is always great whenever we can do that, especially with exercise. Um, so that was pretty encouraging, showing that uh, people with hypermobility can benefit and really, really do benefit from some resistance training. I understand it can be scary sometimes, especially if you are a strength coach um, personal trainer or something like that, you see somebody whose mobility is so out of the normal, uh, it can be a little bit scary to train them, but as long as you educate yourself and do things properly, it can really be beneficial for them. So why is motor control so important? 
athletes with hypermobility, we've said this 10 times already, they typically have poor proprioception and they don't really know where their joints are in space. And so while going through their full range of motion actively may be fine, they should probably not be loading to end range. Um, so we've talked about this a little bit. I wanna use this example. Now, uh, this woman in the picture is a professional Olympic weightlifter, so I'm not here to critique her technique at all. It was just a picture that kind of showed uh, what I wanna talk about. So we can look at that shoulder extension and those of us with any clinical experience can understand that that's forcing the head of the humerus way forward in the shoulder there, which is the way it's most likely to dislocate. So that can be kind of scary position. Um, now, if somebody's not loaded, they may be able to go to that position fine. Their joints are so hypermobile, it can really push forward and come back no problem. But now do we wanna be loading them in that position? and putting all that pressure on the front of a capsule that has some decreased receptors for, uh, for proprioception or for joint position? Probably not. So when we look at this picture, if we were working with this athlete, if she had hypermobility and we were training her, we may wanna train her to stop with an arm position that's straight overhead without that shoulder hyperflexion or hypermobility there. Um, so learning to control that and learning where to stop is really, really important before we're loading. So again, I want to talk about closed pack versus open pack position. So some of you may be very, very familiar with these terms. Some of you may be very unfamiliar with these terms, but uh, I want to bring you all to a point where you can apply it to this population. So closed pack is the joint position where there's maximal contact between articulating surfaces and joint stability is derived from this position. And open pack is the joint position where there's minimal contact between articulating surfaces. So my favorite example for this is the knee. I like to use my arm knee here. So we have a tibia here, we have a femur here. Full extension of the knee is closed pack position. The top of both of my fists are completely touching each other. Now when we go into knee flexion, there's some roll and slide there and we can, the details of that are outside the scope of this presentation, but we can imagine that that knee is flexing, rolling, sliding. And now you can see just the tip of my knuckles is touching that joint surface. That's a lot more of a delicate joint position, a dangerous joint position where a dislocation could happen. So we can look at this skeleton here and he's a little bit blurry. I wanted to make him big enough for you to see, but hopefully we can, uh, we can work on that. So we can see that hip and knee are pretty much closed packed. They're pretty extended. If we were to compress him, uh, those joints would compress, but they probably would not bend, at least with a small amount of compression. They wouldn't change joint position. Then we look at this knee and this hip are kind of in that open pack position. And if we were to compress, compress that leg up, we'd have some changes in joint position here. And um, we can see even in the arm, so we have a little bit more of a closed pack or a compression able joint here, and a little bit more of an open pack joint here that's in that posterior position. So I'd like to use the example of a golf ball on a tee. So we can look at this tee on the right side and we can see that golf ball is pretty stable on that tee. If we were to put a little bit of force on top of it, probably wouldn't go anywhere. Um, pretty much stable there. In the second picture, let's just ignore the golf club. That was the only, uh, only picture I could find there. Um, but that joint, that golf ball is all the way on one side of the joint. So just a little bit of force could knock it out, could dislocate it. And we can imagine that this would be the same whether the ball is on the right side or the left side of the tee. So same thing with an elbow being bent this way is just as unstable, actually probably a little bit less unstable than being hyperextended on the other side of the joint. So when is loading indicated versus contraindicated? Like I say, it can be a little bit scary to load these people if you don't have experience with them, um, but it is really important. So there's two conditions I like to meet before loading somebody with hypermobility, especially because like I said, we might be loading them a little bit earlier in the process than we would some of our other athletes. However, they should have the range of motion to complete whatever the lift movement is pain-free, and they should be able to identify the end range of the lift as opposed to their end range. So we talked about this before. In the elbow, say we're doing an overhead lift, they should be able to go through that position without pain, and they should be able to identify where they would stop that lift 
and not their end or end, which might be hyperextended elbows, hyperextended shoulders, or hyperflexed shoulders, something like that. So when they can identify those things, we can begin to load a little bit of load and then continue to work on form and technique. So I hope you already got some good information from this presentation, um, whether it's something that you already knew or are starting to become more familiar with, but you might be asking, okay, how can I apply this? What can I do with my athletes who are hypermobile? Um, there, we've laid out some principles, but what's the actual meat of it? What's the actual process? So there's three methods here that I want to discuss that we can use. So the first is reactive neuromuscular training. The second is unstable surface training. And the last is varied angle isometrics. So we'll go over these a little bit more. So reactive neuromuscular training is basically feeding into a problem to force a solution. And the example I like to give with this one actually has nothing to do with movement. Uh, most of you might either be parents or you uh, remember your teenage years or you have friends with teenagers, something like that. And you, uh, whether you or your kids or your friend's kid turn 18 and say, mom, dad, I'm 18. You can't tell me what to do anymore. I'm an adult. And now as a parent, you probably have two options here. So the first one is to fight back with them and say, I'm still your mom, I'm still your parent, I can tell you what to do. And that can lead to a lot of back and forth yelling and not getting anywhere. Um, the other way to do it is to feed into their problem to say, okay, sure, you're 18 now, no problem, I can't tell you what to do. Uh, by the way, the rent's due, I'm gonna need your car keys back um, and I'm gonna need your cell phone back since I paid for that. So you're, you're feeding into the problem. Sure, you're, you can be on your own, you're on your own, that's good, let's make it happen, let's make you on your own. Um, now, more than likely, that teenager is gonna say, okay, wait a second, that's not exactly what I asked for. I'm gonna get myself back in line, back doing what I'm supposed to be doing because I don't wanna go that far in the wrong direction. I wanted to go halfway, but I don't wanna go all the way over there. So reactive neuromuscular training is kind of the same thing. Basically, we're stimulating the joint and the receptors to get some, a lot of after a discharge from the CNS. So most popular example of this um, is with, the, with a squat here. A lot of us probably are very familiar with this exercise. So we can see the bands around her knees, and this is somebody who might have some dynamic valgus, and the band is actually forcing her into that valgus, and that's forcing her to come out of it. So it's forcing her to push back out, which is what we wanted in the first place. So that's great. A little bit less common example that we may use with some upper extremity loading is a similar idea in a, in a push-up position or quadruped position, and the elbows, you can see on that first rep, her uh, right elbow, kind of fell into hyperextension. We'll go back and watch that. It kind of gets pulled a little bit there. And the idea is to try to have her avoiding that. So with these exercises, we want to make sure we're progressing from simple to more complex, from uh, less dynamic to more dynamic, unilateral or bilateral to unilateral, supported to unsupported, et cetera. We want to make sure we're progressing these exercises not just having somebody come in, do this squat, and then go back to their elite level athletics. Um, same thing with this. So if this is a gymnast, good example is we might start in quadruped here, go to a push-up position, do the same exercise, go to a downward dog position, do the same exercise, go to a piked handstand with feet supported, do the same exercise, and then potentially go to a handstand and do the same exercise. Um, after that, I wouldn't really use the band past, a, past the handstand, but we could do a similar exercise with a press handstand, cartwheel, round off, uh, walkovers, handsprings, and kind of progress that way. Just may not use the band for safety reasons, depending on the athlete. So that's kind of a summary of RMT. Um, next, we can talk about unstable surface training. So I know there's a lot of controversy about this uh, in the history of training. And I'm not here to debate all that controversy. Uh, what I am here to say is, can it be useful for this population? And what are the goals that we're trying to reach with it? Are we trying to jump on a physio ball with a barbell with our one rep max weight and see if we can squat it? Probably, probably not. I would hope that's not what we're gonna do. Um, but it has been found, uh, 2006 study, that training on an unstable surface, so in this particular example was bench pressing from a physio ball, 
there was a greater amount of muscle activity to produce the same force and there were improvements in proprioception. So going back, that's kind of the main purpose, what we're trying to do with this population is improve their proprioception, improve their understanding of joint position to prevent those unhealthy, unstable joint positions and potentially dislocations. That's all we're trying to do. So if unstable surface training will lead to that improvement, then we're very happy with that. The other thing that's been found to do is decrease muscle reflex time. So a lot of times dislocations happen in this population because they can't sense that a joint is on its way out, on its way to dislocate until it's too far gone. It can't be pulled back. And those muscles may be trying to pull it back, but it's already out, it's already gone. So if we can decrease that time and have those muscles reflex and pull that joint back before it's fully dislocated, that's a great thing. That's a win in my book. Um, and in some situations, it can increase stabilizing muscle activity. So this has been a little bit controversial in the research, and it seems to depend on the joint and manner being trained, the proximity of the unstable surface to the joint, the proximity of the unstable surface to the center of gravity, and the particular action being done. Um, so something I mentioned about that 2006 study was that training on an unstable surface required a greater amount of muscle activity to produce the same force. So if we're trying to do a maximal lift, we're trying to increase the amount of weight that we're lifting, we don't want to require more effort to lift the same amount of weight. That's not going to help us increase the amount of weight that we're lifting, at least not at that particular time. But when we're looking at athletes who are hypermobile, we may not want to overload them to their one rep max to a ton of weight, especially if they have some clinically significant hypermobility, some other stamos, some cartilage or collagen defects, we might not want them at a one rep max. So we do want to increase their muscle activity. We do want to increase their, uh, their effort without necessarily increasing the weight and compression on the joints. So this may be a really beneficial way to do that. A couple of examples of unstable surface training here. So um, again, this one on the right is a little bit more common. This is kind of a, a makeshift balance board, foam roller and a weight plate. And so she's using some stabilization from her knees and hips to try to balance that out. And then we can come over here. Now, this little girl is a girl that I train, and uh, she was jealous that her friend got to be in the video, so she wanted to be in the next one. Uh, something that I should note is she is wearing flip-flops. She should not be wearing that. Uh, I do most of my training barefoot, which is fine. Sneakers are okay, flip-flops not great, but she just uh, kind of jumped in this video wanted to be a part of it, so I let it slide. Um, and here, this the unstable surface is actually what she's holding on to, to do these inverted rows. And that band also should probably be a little bit more even here. Um, but you can see she's gonna require a little bit more shoulder stabilization activity to pull her chin up than if I just had a straight bar right across there. All right, the uh, last, last method that we're going to go over is varied angle isometrics. So this is just exactly what it sounds like, isometric training at different angles throughout the range. And it can be beneficial for sporting and daily activities that require a certain joint angle. So a 2005 study on this type of training showed similar strength gains in these varied angle isometrics. Groups, two groups who went through the range um, dynamically. However, there was improved proprioception and higher strength at the angles that were trained. So for athletes, lifters that we wanna to train to understand different joint angles to be strong in certain positions, maybe it's an overhead position for a lift, or maybe it's the end of the cocking phase for a baseball pitch, um, we might wanna do these isometrics at that position that can improve their proprioception and strength in that particular range. So we'll look at these examples. Again, these guys kind of wanted to jump in here. So we got some pajama pants and uh, all sorts of interesting training outfits, but we'll get the point here. So this is a gymnast. She's going to be doing landing positions, uh, maybe higher, maybe a little bit lower. And so I like to train them. Now the middle position is probably most ideal, but I do like to train the bottom position as well. Some athletes might land really low. They land low in the hole. And we want to make sure they're strong there and can absorb the force in that position um, and then create the force to get out of it, not just collapse into that bottom position. 
This next one here is just some shoulder positions at different angles. Now I'd like to do this with a bar that's a little bit weighted. Uh, she was a little bit tired here, so I just gave her the PVC pipe to go through it uh, to give you guys the idea. But we're just kind of stopping at the different angles that she might need to use for uh, mainly for her bar routine here. All right, so how do I safely progress overload in this population? We always want to talk about progressive overload for weightlifting, for athletes, strength training. Um, but something that we need to remember is that true end range, so locking out at the end of the lift might not be safe. And really overloading those joints, like I said, especially with somebody with clinical hypermobility with a cartilage or collagen defect, may not be uh, safe or really wise to have them throw a ton of weight on the bar especially if that's not something required for their sport, for their activity that they're participating in. But what we can progress is rep, sets, duration, stability requirements. So I think sometimes strength coaches get in the idea of we're only progressing in percent of 1RM, and then we're trying to progress that 1RM. Um, that's one way to do it, but uh, depending, again, depending on the needs of the athletes, we can also progress their reps. We can progress their sets or their duration of the activity. So you might be asking, okay, Sarah, you know, if you work as a physical therapist, you work one-on-one, -on -one, or I work one-on-one, -on -one, um, this might be easy to make some of these changes, but what about if I have a I got a group of 10, 20, 30, 40 kids. Some of them might be a little bit hypermobile. Some of them are stiff. Some of them are right in the middle. Some of them have wonky knees or elbows, but everything else is okay. What do I do? So something that was told to me that I started doing, which I found really helpful, is a color or grouping system. So as I uh, evaluate the athletes before the start of each training block, um, they'll go in one of, usually I try to keep it to three groups. So depending if we're talking about mobility, it'll be hypermobile, normal, and hypermobile. And likely I'm gonna use some colors or something like that to denote it so that we don't have teenage kids saying, I'm normal and you're not, anything like that. Um, but just these different groups. And then when we work on different things, they'll know, okay, red group, uh, you guys warm up first, you do your, your stretches, your mobilizations, blue group, you guys uh, just get a little bit of a jog, get a little bit warmed up, and then you're going to go right to this activity, and green group is going to be, you know, so something else, however it is, and this might be different for different body parts, different patterns, and different workouts, um, so I generally break this down by the main movement patterns, squat, hinge, push, pull, carry, other, um, and athletes are grouped for each of those patterns. So if we're gonna have a push day, we're gonna do some push work, they know which group they're gonna be in and what they need to work on there. And something to remember is that their group assignment may be fluid and it's good if it is. So that's why we wanna continually reassess and at different training blocks. Uh, we may use some of these techniques and get somebody to improve their proprioception and joint stability enough where they don't need to be in the hypermobile group for that joint, that motion, that day, that workout anymore, they can move into a different group. So it's important to continually be assessing them. Likely, uh, just on the, on the opposite side of it, an athlete might get stiff. A lot of us uh, have kids, had our athletes staying home, sitting in a bed, doing some sort of Zoom school for, for months on end this spring and uh, change things in their body a little bit. So that can always happen too. That's why we're just gonna continue to assess and put them in the group that's uh, most beneficial for them at that time. So if you want to get in contact with me, there's some contact info here. If you're looking for a clinician or trainer to work with somebody with Ehlers-Danlos, there is a directory I'm on the committee for here. Um, you can copy that link. That's for the United States. They do have directory for all different countries as well. Um, you can follow that link and then go to all countries from there. There are my references. And if you have any questions, all of you watching this version are watching a recording. So feel free to email me, uh, DM me, anything like that. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation.